staring brutal reality in the face and seeing it for what it is as fast as you can is critical to then knowing what decisions to make. I tell him what he want to do and he says like, oh man, that sounds like a really fun project. Let's do that. Welcome to the Real Estate 101 podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Donnelly. And with me today is Ben Miller, CEO of Fundrise. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk with you. I've done a ton of research, very eager to get into this. Appreciate your time as well. So I've got a ton of questions, obviously, about Fundrise. I want to get into markets, trends, things like that. But before we do, I wanted to hear more about your background growing up in a real estate family. Your dad was a developer, I believe, in the D.C. area. What was it like growing up with him? Uh, how much did you absorb from conversations around the dinner table? Did you work with him in the summers? That kind of thing. What 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 did you learn from him growing up? So my dad had a huge impact on me. He was like my hero growing up. He was a big personality. I mean, a really big personality. When he came in the room, all eyes would go on him. He is a quintessential entrepreneur and the archetype of a developer which if people don't know, if you don't have like an extreme entrepreneur developer in your world, they are, they are vision. He's a visionary. They are always thinking about big ideas, excited about changing the world. And he's, you know, he, he really is remarkable. I mean, in the industry in the eighties and the early nineties, like he did a lot Was business a common topic around the dinner table. Did he bring work home? Was it Talking about money and development and, and that kind of thing, was that common growing up? And you've got a brother too, right, that is involved? Yeah. So he never really talked to me about business directly. Uh, I think he didn't think I'd be in business. I think he thought I'd be some other profession. And so I I, I watched and I was he always would bring me places and because he, he's he was always working. So if I was with him, he was working. And so so of course I saw a lot, but he didn't actually think of me as like a business person until I was in college and I got a job with another sort of real estate mogul. And that real estate mogul really liked me, wanted me to work for him. My father's like, wait, what's going on here? And then he then he became interested, but wasn't he didn't no, I didn't he brought home the stress, but he didn't talk about what was happening, you know, at work that I remember growing up. Yeah. So so that developer that you mentioned, he, he's a Philadelphia developer, right? A guy named um, Ira Lubert? Yeah, he's not a developer. I, yeah, Ira Lubert. Lubert. He's not a developer. He's a investor, a huge investor, with, you know, billions of dollars, real estate, technology, hedge funds. I mean, he's a, he's a, a mogul, absolute mogul. I went to work for him in college and he and I hit it off. I actually, I brokered this deal that a deal fell apart that he had been working on, it fell apart. And then I, I went off on my own and sort of got a hold of the people involved and brought it back to life. And he w was surprised by that and then gave me like $40,000 of, of um, shares in the company I, that, we, um, that I basically brought back to, to, to life. And my father, and this is like, I'm like a kid, right? I'm like in college. And my father was like, what is going on here? No, this is he's you know this is mine. This is my kid. You mm -hmm. can't take him. And then all of a sudden, he was like really interested in me as a business person. Yeah, and this was in college. He gave you this kind of responsibility. Oh, my father or the or Ira? Ira. Yeah, Ira. Yeah. Well, I mean, I yeah, Ira. I mean, he didn't he didn't give me the responsibility. I was working for him as an analyst, and Ira back then had just started his first real estate fund. Um, and now I, I think, I think again, he has $8 billion, but that time he had hundred million. I think that was the size of the fund and his office was small and I was an analyst and I was working on a deal and it fell apart and I just went off on my own to, and, and, and brought it back, brought the deal back to life. But he, you know, if you're a really good leader or manager, you can look around the room and see who's paying attention you see who's getting it. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he thought I did and, and started like, using me as his like, you'd call it in politics, like his body, right? His like person who just, he who would be with him everywhere and just get handed all sorts of work. Right, right. So when you decided to leave him, I think you started a, your own venture called Popularize? 
No, no, Is no. That right? <laughs> it's actually you're off by a decade. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry. So let let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. Then we'll get to popularize later, maybe. But um, he at one point, maybe it was when you were starting popularize. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Didn't he say he wished upon you a great failure? Like he said, you would learn more from that than anything else. Basically, wished upon you failure. And I'm really wondering how you took that when he said it, um, and then maybe the lessons from the business that that he was referencing. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to date myself here, but that was actually 1999. And I, I left to work for a tech startup and in 1999, that was the thing to do. And he basically wanted me to stay and build his business. And obviously he grew from a business that had a hundred million dollars of real estate to $9 billion of real estate. And so I saw him years later and he said, if you'd stayed, you would have made $50 million. So he, you know, I think he um, wanted me to stay. But anyway, so yeah, I went to go work for a tech startup. And when I was leaving, he said, well, if you're going to go do this at a young age, I hope you, I wish upon you a, a tremendous failure because you'll learn way more from that than from success. And the tech startup I went to work for was a tremendous failure. It was like out of, it almost could have been a book how outrageous and, and the whole experience was. And so, yeah, and I learned a lot from that. I mean, it, you basically learn more from stressed periods than from when from pe- when periods are are normal. Whether it's two thousand eight or two thousand one, that those lessons like really were key to Funrise. Basically, my thinking on Funrise. So, so what were some of those lessons from that failure? What would you have done differently, or or what were the mistakes you were glad you made that affected later on down the road the success of Funrise? Yeah, well, so you know, 1999, I was I was like just out of you know college. I think I was 23 when I was working for this um, tech startup, and I so I was not the executive, not the principals, but I watched them make mistakes, and I was you know working 100 hours a week, and so the, the biggest mistake they made was they let what they wanted to have happen get in the way of seeing what was actually happening, and I came away from that experience with the lesson that staring brutal reality in the face and seeing it for what it is as fast as you can is critical to then knowing what decisions to make. Yeah. I remember as a young guy, I was, I went through a Tony Robbins phase, you know, I was really optimistic. And I remember asking my dad, who's a developer, I'm like, would you consider yourself an optimist? And he's like, no, (laughs) I'm a, I'm a realist. You know, you've got to, like you said, stare the facts in the face and adjust accordingly. Yeah, it's it's something inside the organization at Fundrise and sometimes with my family is I always first go to the problems. I go to the, the really tough, negative things and I focus on them first. And people then say like, why are you so pessimistic? And I say, no, 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 no. This is just how you get to, how is how you built up to accomplishing big things. You have to start with like, the really ugly things and, and not just think this fun and do the things that are enjoyable that you really need to do things that are not enjoyable. That's how you succeed. Yeah. I was talking to my dad on the phone yesterday. We put out a newsletter at, at the investors podcast network and it's called we study markets. I'd encourage our listeners to sign up for it. It's hundred percent free, but I'm writing an article on traits of like top successful investors, developers, investors. And I asked my dad that kind of along the lines of, you know, making decisions and things like that, being a realist as a, you know, optimist, pessimist, that kind of thing. And he's like, his, one of his main points was like, you've got to look at the worst case scenario in this, in a situation going into anything, any investment, he first looks at, at the worst case situation, worst case scenario, rather. Is that something you guys do also at, at Fundrise? Yes, that's definitely one of the key, it's almost axiomatic. And the people who don't do that I don't know how you can be successful. Now, let me, I'll add a caveat after this, but Seth Klarman, who's a famous value investor says, if you take care of the downside, the upside takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely true for real estate. Now the caveat is venture investing and technology is different. It's really the obverse or opposite of real estate. Real estate is a value business with real things. And, and technology is a virtual business. But the interesting thing is, is that they use similar language, 
So in te technology, there are software developers, there are software architects, there are designers who are a lot like architects in, in the fact that they build things usually that look good, but don't work as well. Um, now we have, our team has, we have great designers, but a lot of designers focused on, as they say in, in, in real estate, you build a building from the outside in, if you, rather than building from the inside out, right? You want to build a building from the inside out, but a lot of architects start with renderings and pretty pictures mm -hmm. and they may not work as a, as a building. So there's just uncanny how many actual really similar um, patterns there are between real estate and tech and language, even though you wouldn't think they're at all related. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Seth Klarman. We do a lot of, you know, focuses on newsletters, a lot of value investors. So Seth, we've definitely written about, uh, you know, the whole idea of margin of safety and that kind of thing is really important. I wanted to circle back to your experience in 2008. You mentioned 2008 and some other, you know, two, maybe 1999 as tough periods. Um, for older guys that lived through that, there's a lot of younger listeners that we have that maybe haven't gone through a downturn like 2008. And I don't, I don't know that we're necessarily going to experience that again. I could totally be wrong. We're definitely in some sort of correction here. And I definitely, I also want to get your thoughts on yeah. what's going on Agreed. in the market. But um, I wanted to hear, I think at that point you joined your father's company and that you guys had maybe $500 million of under construction and then your biggest lender, GMAC, went bankrupt. Bank of America stopped doing construction loans. So many developers at that time, especially ones with a lot of leverage, obviously got crushed. I think it turned out pretty well for your company. But tell us how it was for you going through the great financial crisis and then how it affected your view of Wall Street, the financial markets, and, and banking in general. Tough times, for sure. And I joined my father's real estate company, I think it was more like 2005 can't remember now, but it was, so we, I saw the run up and, you know, really the, the, the peak of liquidity was 2007. And then I saw it all come crashing down. And so for us, basically we had some big institutional capital partners on the equity side, like, like GMAC commercial, which changed their name to Capmark when KKR and Goldman and, um, square, square mile, five mile bought them. And then, um, Mass Mutual Cornerstone and AFL-CIO. And that crisis was a debt crisis, right? So it turned out that all the institutions that were providing money didn't have any money. They were just borrowing it. And so the amount of leverage in the system was astronomical. And, and, and when that leverage had to basically come down, there were all liquidity left the market. There's, there was no money in the market, which happens basically every... I don't know, 10 to 15 years. And the last time it happened was 1990, 1991, 1992. And, and now I think it's happening again. And so like the, you know, the obvious lessons and, and so much of our, our learning, I think as a professional is just learning things everybody else like has to learn and should know for whatever reason, it takes a while to learn it. And, and that one is simple. It's just don't, don't over lever, you know, you have low amounts of leverage, have more equity in deals. And so, you know, we had a deal, big deal, a couple, a hundred, hundred million dollar deal. And, um, we, had, I think our leverage was 83% from GMAC commercial, which is, you know, General Motors acceptance corporation, which used to have a big uh, lending arm until they spun it off because GM, you know, ultimately went bankrupt in a way. And, um, 83% at the time, it seems smart. Like, oh my God, we got this really cheap loan and then we got equity and like, you know, the, the real estate sponsor, people don't know, look at a real estate developer and, and look at their big deals. And you're like, you know, they only have probably 1% of the money in that deal, maybe half a percent. It's not really, the real estate industry's changed over the last, let's say three decades where a lot of real estate developers and, and, and managers are basically middlemen. I mean, they do a lot of the work, but there's not actually like the old school, like Larry Silverstein or, or any big old developer where a lot of the money is their own money. They own that building and they may not have any leverage. So it's, so anyways, when you have investments where most of the money, 99% or 99.5% of the money is not your money, lo and behold, people behave a little differently than if it was their all, all their own money. They take on more risk. They 
don't necessarily behave like a fiduciary. And I think that was what was happening really broadly in 2008. And so another lesson was basically, I, I no longer believe institutions when they tell me that they're so big and so smart and so sophisticated. I think that's like salesmanship. And generally, you know, they might be okay, but they're not what they seem to be. And then in 2008, every major institution that I know of was insolvent. I mean, they were insolvent. They basically, if they hadn't gotten bailed out by the government, many more would have gone bankrupt other than Lehman Brothers. How smart can you be if you're insolvent? Like maybe not as smart as you say you are. Right. Yeah. I had the same experience just to call it into question everything. I was a finance major and called into question everything I'd been taught about finance and money and banking. And it sounds like kind of similar experience for you. Main takeaway, it sounds like be really careful with leverage. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you want to be successful, don't try to have it happen overnight. Take your time. You know, be methodical. We always say at the company, be the tortoise, not the hare. A lot of times, it's also like, what's your goal? My goal isn't to be, you know, the richest person in the world. I just want to have like, I want to do interesting things and to do interesting things. You need to be able to take risk and to take risk, you need to have a stable foundation. Right, right. So I, I want to get more into understanding Fundrise. Imagine you're sitting next to a guy on an airplane, just kind of a Joe Blow kind of guy. And he asks you what you do for a living, what your company does. What do you say to him? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would turn to him and we were talking. He says, what do you do? I'd say something like, hey, do you invest in stocks? It's like, yeah, I have, you know, Schwab, Fidelity. Do you invest in bonds? Yeah, I have bonds. Do you invest in real estate? Mm, no. Why not? I don't know. It's not, it's not really available the same way stocks, you know, I can buy stocks and bonds easily through you know, my brokerage account through an app. And I said, well, that's a problem. Real estate's a great asset. It's actually one of the best performing assets in history. It should be as easy, as seamless, as low cost to invest in real estate as to invest in stocks and bonds. And that's what we do. We make, we basically democratize investing in real estate. We digitize it and make it basically available to you so that you can diversify your portfolio the way every institution invest today. How'd you come up with the idea for Fundrise? So after the 2008 great financial crisis, it was about 2010. And I was like, uh, I would say like pretty jaundiced about institutions. Uh, and I was, cause you know, I, I mean, we had to go buy our, that hundred million dollar deal I was describing that where the lender and the equity were both bankrupt we had to go buy it out of bankruptcy from our partner. We went through like a 256G bankruptcy proceeding where you have to go buy it and you get an auction. And I was just like, what is this nonsense? This and so I was walking my dog thinking about like how to raise money for real estate deals. And I was just said, well, why can't I raise it on the internet? Like, why can't we just democracy? Why can't anybody do this? Why is it just these institutions who don't know what they're doing or just are, are, are maybe not the, the best of what they, as, as partners. And I just started thinking about why, why can't you raise money on the internet for real estate? Like why can't people invest in real estate? It doesn't make any sense. It should, you should be able to. So that actually was, it's a big idea, but it's a simple idea. It doesn't seem like some idea that no one else has ever had. And like a lot of ideas, it's all about execution, right? The execution is what makes it work or not work. I heard you mention that you don't like to call Fundrise a, a crowdfunding platform. I think you mentioned you at one point called it online syndication, but maybe that name hasn't taken hold. Have you settled on a name that explains what you guys, what Fundrise does? Yeah. I mean, I, I again, I if you're thinking about investing in stocks or investing in bonds and you're going through the internet, you're just investing in, in stocks. You're buying stocks, like investing in real estate. You're just investing in real estate. Like our fund structures are like the same fund structures you would buy stocks in, their mutual fund structures or 40 Act. It's the same as buying stocks, except for it's buying real property. And so that's like um, why I think of it as just like, you know, BlackRock or Vanguard who raises a lot of money through the internet to invest in stocks. Like no one calls them a crowdfunder or Amazon who, who does everything through the internet and their apps. Like what transactions do you not do through the internet? everything. 
So, so it's just like, it's just because the real estate industry is so old fashioned that they're like, what's this crazy whiz bang stuff that kids are doing these days? Right, right. So explain to us how Fundrise, you mentioned BlackRock, uh, explain how Fundrise, along with your fee structure, which is lower, I think, than most typical REITs, explain how Fundrise is different than a typical REIT along with the fee structure. So um, public companies, public REITs or public tech companies are usually mature. They're mature, you know, a public REITs usually low growth and um, it's, it's a really a asset management company. They sit there and they are a steward and they sort of own these properties and they sort of mostly chug along. That's the public markets. The private markets are where businesses get created, where mostly real estate gets built. You know, if you think about what's the difference between, you know, public tech companies like IBM and venture capital, you know, venture capital is where businesses get created and funded and high risk, high reward, and that's what the private markets do. And so the exact same thing happens in real estate. You know, private equity in real estate is higher risk, higher reward, more growth, more dynamism. And when it's basically mature and stable and a little bit more boring, it goes public. And then basically you sell it to public markets at a premium. And that's the difference between like a black stone, which is a private equity fund and black rock, which is a public equi equity manager. And so that's a fundrise just democratizes investing into private markets, into the part of the market that people used to not be able to invest in. And it's, and it's, it's real estate in the private markets is, is I think again, a little bit more dynamism, I think a generally a higher return, maybe higher risk, and um, you know, kind of where the where the, where the new things happen. New things happen in real estate and tech in the private markets. So, wasn't Fundrise maybe the first platform to attempt to raise money using the internet? And I think the building that you were trying to raise money for, if I read this and studied correctly, was right next or very close to the SEC building. And it took two years, around two years, to fund the first project. I'm real interested what the regulatory hurdles were. It's super ironic, I think, that you guys were next to the SEC. What were those hurdles like to jump through in the early days of the company? Yeah, so it's September 2010 when I'm walking my dog and I think about this idea. And it's August 2012 when we actually launched the first offering. So it took a long time, almost two years, right? That's 23 months from conception to launch. And so we always say we launched in 2012, but it took a long time. And uh, we had to do three things all at once, right? We had to go buy a real estate prop property to have a real estate deal to do this with. We had to build a technology platform so people could transact and, and, and we could manage it through a software uh, solution. And then we had to get regulatory, basically like green light. And that, regulatory green light or regulatory like uh, qualification was novel. Like no one had ever sold real estate through the internet ever, or, or at least not in the modern, uh, modern days. And so I went to law firm after law firm just saying like, how do I do this? And I went to, you know, big law firms, you know, all sorts of law firms everybody's heard of. And they, you get sort of reactions like that's cute. <laughs> Or I know how to do this, but actually I didn't know how to do it. And I most most like sort of like the best story from that period was I went to second most fancy law firm in the country. I mean, certainly top three, the law firm that most investment banks use. And their office was at the Condé Nast building, which is it's a Times Square, really, really beautiful building, top, you know, top floor. I go in, meet with the head of their real estate practice and head of the securities practice. And I think if anybody knows how to do this, it's them. I tell them like we gotta democratize real estate, and the, you know the financial system is broken. Two thousand eight financial crisis proved that we need a new model, and I have this big pitch. I remember looking over the horizon at, at the sun setting on New York, and I finish, and there's sort of dead silence. And the guy says, "Well, why would you bother with a little guy? Like, why bother? 
And I said, like, I got like a little upset and I was like, cause it's, you know, Wall Street's screwing them. And he said, what's your opinion? And I was like, well, isn't there a lot of people downstairs protesting Occupy Wall Street? Like, is it really like a up for debate at this point? Like, <laughs> didn't the divided financial system just melt down and get bailed out by the government? So anyways, um, that was a, that didn't work. That was dry hole. And by pure luck, one of my friend's brother-in-law had just retired from the SEC and he was head of internet enforcement at the SEC. So I go, like, oh, meet this guy. That, that sounds like what I need, right? And I go, I didn't know anything about the SEC back then. Like, so I get it. I go to his office and he just like started private practice. And I said, here's what I want to do. And I told him and he said, you know, I'm from enforcement. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. He said, I don't know anything about this stuff. Like I'm a lawyer basically, right? I, I like, I'm like a, a, a prosecutor. You're like, you need to go to Corp Finn and go to the guru, Marty Dunn. And I was like, who's Marty Dunn? He's like, he's the guy. He's the guy. And, you know, as you know, always in any place or, or any sector, there's the guy or the, or, the, or the woman, there's the person. Like if you try to build, like I remember trying it, we built a development in Asheville, North Carolina, like way back. And there's the guy and the guy was the ex-mayor of Asheville. And he was, you know, Lou. And he was like, he's how you got everything done in Asheville. Right. There's always, uh, there's always a person. There's always a guy. So I went to Marty, got a lunch, lunch meeting with him. He comes down. He, he worked at a Melvinie Myers. He comes down to like BLT steak, this fancy restaurant. I was so nervous. I told him what he wanted to do. And he says like, Oh man, that sounds so fun. Like that's so fun. That sounds like a really fun project. Let's do that. And we did. And we spent it, you know, he, he took me into the SEC to meet with them. And they're like, that sounds fun. And, and they're, and they're trying to figure out what regulations to use. And Marty said in there, he's like, well, in 1996, I wrote this regulation three, you know, he's like spouting the numbers. He would always like know every regulation and then the number of it. And, and he'd be like, we could use that one. And they, you know, basically all these people used to work for him who, who were at the SEC. And so like, he just shepherded me through the process and the SEC saw it as like, at that time in 2011, they really were worried about capital formation, which basically means raising money for, for businesses because there was no money, right? There was no liquidity in, after the great financial crisis. And they wanted to show that they were like helping. And so that was, this was like more of like a showcase demo. And it cost me a hundred thousand dollars of legal fees to raise $300,000 from, you know, 300 people. <laughs> wow. But it, it was like not meant to be economic. It was meant to be like a, you know, a proof that we could do it. And, you know, we did, I mean, we did, it just, it was, <laughs> if you were, if you, if you were a securities attorney, I could get into like the Howey test and all this sort yeah. of really silly things happened that, that were interesting for securities attorneys, but like it, we created the model. I mean, like the checkout, how does checkout work? And then a lot of people who ended up starting companies that were like ours signed up for, I mean, I know every single person that started a company that sort of on this idea of raising money on the internet I can tell you when they joined Funrise, you know, <laughs> their username, like I, they all came to Funrise and like they modeled it after us. And, and it's funny because we then stopped doing that business in 2020, sorry, in 2015, because we thought it wasn't the right way to scale. And we changed our business to more like a Blackstone model. And they all went that other path. And I think that's like, we created it and left it because we thought it wasn't the right model to scale. And it's, I think it's why we were successful and then they basically mostly haven't, haven't been or don't exist anymore, but that's a different story. Yeah. What are you doing differently now? What was the change that you made that they didn't do? So I have been through crises and I was worried that, so syndication in real estate means you raise money from people for a deal, a single deal. And it's kind of old fashioned way of doing real estate, like you know, if you went back to the fifties or 1960s or seventies, like that's how real estate was done. And that's how we started. And we did 44 single deal fundings. Like where we had, you know, hundreds of investors or something in a, in a one deal. And I was freaked out by that structure because I said, if there's another financial crisis and we need money to recapitalize a deal or pay down a loan or, just work out the deal. 
because there's a misperception of how much real estate's in motion. There, this single deal structure is brittle. It doesn't let you do that. It'll break under stress. It's not. It's too fragile. It doesn't allow you be, to have a dynamic. If you think of real estate as a business, not as a as a, like a piece of property, as a brick, you would see why it might need more money and needs to be flexible. And so we moved to a fund model like a Blackstone or a Starwood or like the real estate industry is now structured as funds. Those really were invented in the early 90s. Like the fund model is the dominant model for real estate. It's the better model, it's the more resilient, it's the more flexible, it's the more scalable. So we moved to the fund model in 2015. And when we did that, we lost half our customers. Half our customers said, well, we don't want funds. We want deals. And I said, I just, I'm too risk averse. I don't want to be doing just deals. And so we changed, we left in, and that was painful. We lose half our, half our customers. Did you expect that to happen? I knew that a lot of customers didn't like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew it was going to be unpopular, but I didn't know it would be that bad because our investors liked, they were more like stock pickers. You know, like some people are, are stock pickers and they'd like to buy Tesla or buy Apple or, or you know, underwrite this real estate deal and have an opinion about this deal versus that deal. Ultimately, there are way more passive fund investors who buy you know, long-term diversified portfolios of stocks than there are stock pickers. That was an insight we had. Even though it was different than we originally conceived, it's a bigger, better business. It's safer and I think more appealing to more people because of how many people want to go say, oh, I have this deal of apartment building in Bend, Oregon. You know, it's here's the price per square foot. Here's the debt structure. Like how many people know how to underwrite that and want to? Mostly like people who are like, it's just a different customer. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good explanation. It's really, I mean, there's way more index fund investors than, you know, Warren Buffett right. says, invest in index, for, for the average person, invest in index funds. Exactly. So we did that for real estate. Yeah. We indexed, we're, we're indexing the, the real estate private markets you index. We can index build for rent. You can index multifamily. There's, we've created a way to index it, but real estate people and financial types and venture types have told me, told us we were wrong. We were idiots. Like, I had partners who were thought we were dead wrong. And I, and I said, no, you guys are b- building a product that you want. And you think everybody is like you, which is a key way you build software or products or real estate. You got to build it for the customer. And so you have to understand the customer and put yourselves in the customer's mind and seat and shoes. That's not something that everybody can do, but it's critical to building great products. Yeah, this brings me to my next question. Um, one of my newer investment heroes is a guy named Nick Sleep. Uh, he's featured in William Green's book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. If you haven't read, any listeners haven't read, I highly recommend the book. And Nick says that he wants to invest in companies that practice what he calls scale economy shared. So these are companies like Amazon and Costco that are completely customer focused. And they create a flywheel in the business model such that their efficiencies as they grow larger and larger in scale, they're able to pass along those savings to their customers. They create customer loyalty and satisfaction and lifelong customers. So, and from my research of Fundrise, it seems, you know, the company is also completely customer focused. Tell us how the company is using, using technology to lower costs for the for, for your investors and how the company, which I think is completely vertically integrated, aligns incentives and produces maybe higher returns than the average REIT? Okay, two different questions. Let me do the first one about technology and the second one about economics and fees and incentives. Because man, are incentives important. So technology. So this is not something we intended. And I feel like many great inventions were not intended that to be a great invention. So we started with the customer and we started with having many customers. We have, today we have 383,000 investors. So we have a lot of investors and we built an, you know, a website and apps and then infrastructure to make that possible. So we have payment processing and, and performance reporting and, and 
a lot of different kinds of software, basically to have a huge number of customers processing and investing and reporting seamlessly. And there's all sorts of sneaky complexity around APIs and about um, you know having the website be respon- responsive and performant. And I mean, the whole team, all they do is focus on the speed at which people the, something happens on the site or on the apps. So we we you know that I, we've I think we've successfully democratized real estate, but that gave us a foothold that was unique because the real estate industry does not have technology from this century. The real estate industry is built on technology from the nineties and those, and that technology, if you're a real estate person, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a PC computer, personal computer and Microsoft office suite in particular, Microsoft Excel. And that is, and that is the backbone technology of real estate, doing things in Excel, modeling things in Excel, setting that Excel spreadsheet to different people. Um, you know, it's it's that's basically how real estate thinks about. I mean, my God, how think they think about real estate? They think of it first as a financial model, and maybe they think about it as like a building, and they don't think about it as a consumer experience, right? That's like some rarely think of it as like, you know, someone's living there, shopping there. It's an experience, it's a product. And the financial success of the product is a derivative of its product experience. But that's not how most people in real estate think. So so anyways, if you are trying to, in, if you're trying to penetrate the real estate industry with technology, the real estate industry basically will reject you. It's, they're not going to change their behavior. And the thing about technology is that behavior is the primary barrier to change. And we saw this in the pandemic. We adopted work from home overnight. The technology was clearly there. Nobody was going to adopt work from home without something forcing them to do it. And that happens over and over and over again with technology. It actually usually takes a whole generation. The young generation will adopt it. The old generation will not. And it takes like, you know, there's a uh, Max Planck famous physicist said that like progress is made f- funeral to funeral progress in science. So, so the, so the forced adoption of, of um, work from home or remote work was like an aberration. Normally it just takes generational change. So anyways, um, we don't have to seek institutions or real estate companies approval or change in behavior to adopt new technology. We can basically build technology for ourselves and then use that technology in the way we do business. And so slowly but surely, we started with a sort of customer. We start with the money. We worked our way back. So now more and more of our processes, more and more of the way real estate's done, is done with software, with databases. And that's, it's so complicated and, and, and subtle that it's, which probably requires its own podcast, but we are, I mean, it's going to radically, we're in the process of radically changing how real estate's done. And then when we're, when we're done with that, or, or at least have gotten to sort of a, a phase where we're ready to, we're going to offer that software infrastructure to everybody else. And that will probably, we'll start offering that next year, maybe 2024, depending on when we're ready. But like the way that we do real estate, the infrastructure we use is how, you know, if you think about Amazon or Google or any real technology company, they don't use Microsoft Excel. They use infrastructure, these databases. So we, but we, we, we built that because we could, and we're, you know, we have half our team's software engineers, like we're different animal and that's like, there's so much in that, that like, it makes us better, I think, different, lower cost. And that, you know, it's a great business, but then we're going to, then we're going to basically you know, express that technology for everybody because a technology company, well, here, a financial company, when they get an advantage, they trade on the advantage, right? They, they oh, I have inside information. I have a better mousetrap. I'm going to make more money. And a technology company gets an advantage and they share it. So everybody can take advantage of it so they can basically 
have the infrastructure that expands and make money as infrastructure company. So we're going to basically share it. And I think it'll make us better and everybody better. And that's like a long, it's a long answer because it's so complicated. It's just, it's big. It's a big change for real estate. Yeah. I mean, it's creating a larger and larger network effect in essence, right? Is that what, how you would describe what you're doing? It's about data and process. And that is ultimately about um, scale and network effects, but the advantages of data and, and, and processes that change are um, the, the, you can measure it ultimately by sort of adoption and compounding, you know, compounding uh, scale through sort of like the system gets better as more people, the you know, data gets better, the, the processes get better as more people use it. But like you, you, if you, if you using like uh you know, AWS using in kind infrastructure, like you don't experience that. You just experience it being cheaper, faster, and easier. And that's what like, you know, that, that's, it's a good business because of the network effect, but it's a good product because of the outcomes from that. Got it. So I wanted to get back to the fee structure and how what you're doing, I believe makes the fees ch much cheaper than a typical REIT. Can you talk specifically about how the, the fee structure works? Yeah, it's so different. It's, it's so I would say it's different than a typical private equity fund. And that's, you have to know a little bit about real estate and private equity to appreciate how different it is. But I'll, so I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll try to explain it to you and then maybe you can explain to listeners what a carried interest is. So in real estate, a real estate developer or real estate private equity fund, they get fees, asset management fees or, or you know, the development fees. They get fees to run their business, but they make the money, the big upside, the profits are in the promote, the carried interest, the share of the upside. A typical real estate company would get 20 to 30% of the upside and a typical fund would get about 20% of the upside. And venture capital, same thing. Venture capital companies who invest in tech companies get 20% of the upside or more. And so that's really where the big money's made and that's the big cost to the investor. So everybody focuses on fees, you know, is it 1%, is it 1.5%, but the carried interest like it's like this is vast, vastly bigger. On the upside, it can be 10, 20, 100 times more than the, the fees you make. And Fundrise isn't taking any carried interest. Is that correct? Right. Or, or so a there's nominal amount? No carried interest in our, in our funds that are publicly available. And that's, there's two ways that's different, right? The funds that, the funds that invest the money don't take carried interest. We're vertically integrated. So we started our own real estate operating platform. The real estate operating platform doesn't take a carried interest. So there's typically two carried interests in a, in a real estate investment for the end investor. Like the California State Teachers Pension Fund will pay, you know, Starwood, a private equity fund carried interest, and then they'll pay, and Starwood will invest it with Holland Group or some real estate company, and Holland Group will get carried interest. So there's two carried interests equal to about 50% of the upside. And that is zero and so our investors who are putting in small dollars compared to institutions are paying lower fees than the institutions, which yeah. defies all. It's like, it's like almost like the laws of gravity are reversed because that's not how any institution thinks it should work. Sure. Sure. It's a head scratcher. So I wanted to get into how 2022 has been for, for Fundrise. Um, you were featured, we were talking earlier, um, in Fortune Magazine. And congratulations. That was a really cool article. I really enjoyed it. As you mentioned, you've got, a, I forget the exact number, 370,000 investors, uh, mostly millennials, age 25 to 40, and you're gaining about 1,000 new users a day. I think you've got about 200 assets under management with $6 billion, uh, roughly market value. Um, and I think that puts Fundrise in about the world's top 20 private equity real estate firms. Since 2017, Fundrise has delivered annualized gains of around 12%. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're up about 5.5% this year when both stocks and bonds are, are in double-digit negative returns. Looking back on 2022, how's inflation and the current market broadly impacted your current real, real estate portfolio? And I'm wondering what keeps you up at night 
lately. Ooh, a lot, again, a lot of questions in there. <laughs> and those are some deep questions. So uh, let me try to take it one by one. And as you can tell, unfortunately, a, a lot of my weaknesses, one of them is I'm not succinct. <laughs> I can't help but give a long answer because I just, that's just, I, I just can't help myself. So unfortunately, bear with me here. Yeah. So the lesson I learned in 2008 and I carried with me was not to over leverage the deals. And so, Broadly, the real estate in industry, like if you're a private developer, your leverage is probably 65% to 75%, maybe 80% on a typical deal. And our average leverage across our funds today is about 43 to 46%. So much lower leverage. That means that when there's a shock to the system, like there's an economic shock, we're able to absorb the shock. And if you have 75% leverage, right, leverage or debt is an amplifier. It amplifies upsides and amplifies downsides. People forget about the that it's like uh, <laughs> both, up, both up and down. And so that shock, which is happening in the market today, there's a shock in the market, is going to basically cause some people to lose their deals or really lose a lot of money. So that's like the, the, per, the hopefully the perennial philosophy we apply um, we, I think we invested in the right strategies. Like another belief I have, and, and this, we could almost debate this cause you're, you know, a lot about real estate. If you, if you're at, operating at, at some scale, like if you're buying, like we, 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 my goodness, we invest in a lot of real estate deals. We buy a lot of real estate. Um, I learned this in 2008 too, actually, which is that the macro is more important than the micro. The real estate person is obsessed with the deal. They're just deal, 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 deal. It creates lots of management challenges because I'm like, what about management? What about like kept checking in with the team and how they're feeling? They're like, no, I just want to talk to them about deals. <laughs> so deal, 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 deal. And so they think that all the alpha is created at the deal level, but is is not created at the deal level. It's there's a and this is this is the same thing we saw with stocks and bonds and and index investing. As good a stock picker as you are, the index beats you net of fees. And why is that? And so real estate used to be, I think it used to be about the deals. Like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, no question. It was about the deals. Because the, the market used to be inefficient. But now the market is efficient. There's, there's almost no such thing as an off-market real estate deal of, of any consequence. Like if you're going to buy a $20 million apartment building, the price is set by the market, by the auction. There's no, there's no world where you're buying that thing and it's worth $10 million and you're buying it for – or it's worth – sorry, it's worth $40 million and you're buying it for $20 million. That just doesn't happen. That's used to happen. I mean, maybe it happens like I think I, in my career, maybe bought like two deals out of – 500 or some that where that's happened. So this is not, if you're going to buy one deal in your life or one deal every couple of years, like maybe you can pull that off, but I don't, I don't believe it. Now that's what every real estate de developer and investor says they're doing. They're all say they're doing off market deals and they all say that they're, you know, doing all this analysis, but the market is set the price, sorry, the price is set by the market. So, okay. The, the price is set by the market when, where are the returns, where do you get alpha? So it's, it's not at the deal level. I mean, you, there, there is a little. I'm not saying there's none. It's just like it's way, way overblown in the minds of the real estate industry. And you have to be able to execute. I mean, execution is like, it's almost like, what are we talking about? That's, uh, that's like table stakes. But the, I, so I'll go macro. I'll go top down. So if you are a great office developer, you're a great retail developer, you are hosed today. You are completely, if you're an office developer today, you could be the smartest office developer with the best execution, but office is getting wiped out because of the macro. And the macro was one, work from home destroyed the office industry. So technology was the big disruptor, just like technology and e-commerce destroyed retail. Then the the cycle or the, the, the what's happening with the overall um you know, high inflation and high interest rates, that's basically crushing real estate. And then geography, you know, if you're in, if you're in San Francisco versus in Austin, the asset allocation office, 
the geography, you know, Austin versus San Francisco, and then the and just the general cycle, that dictates 80, 90 percent of returns. And if you were in residential or industrial and you bought that in 2010 or you did great. You did great. And so it, and you know whether you bought you know this deal or that deal, a rising tide lifted all boats and a, and a falling tide, you know, basically withdrew returns. And so if you if you aren't in the right asset class in the right geography with the right leverage, you did or didn't do great returns. And that's just not how the real estate industry that's not the narrative the real estate industry tells about how returns are generated. Because that's, I think they want to believe that they, it's their day to day work, which is again table stakes. So that's just a big, big difference. And so we were in the right asset classes, and we were not in the wrong asset classes. We're, we're not in office. We're not in retail. We're not in hotels. We're in rental, residential, and industrial. And that basically, and and we have low leverage, and we're in the Sun Belt. We're in the right geographies. And that basically generated great returns. That sounds more like index investing, right? That's what we believe in. And so, and we didn't have a carried interest. Like, so when inflation went up in 2021, rents went up in our properties 20, 30%, right? Across billions of dollars of, of real estate. If we had a carried interest, we would have made hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> I would have made hundreds of millions of dollars. And I made zero off of that because we don't take a carried interest because mm -hmm. basically we think it's more scalable and more differentiating and disruptive to, in the long run. So, so we were in the right asset classes and we are still in the right asset classes. So that's basically what drove our returns. And, 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 I, and yeah, okay, we also bought good real estate and we have good underwriting and, but it's, I, I just don't think that that's, it's just not what we're selling and not what I think is the reality. And, and, and same thing happened in 2008, man, you, we had, I, I did so much work on like, what design is the fixture on the, on the, on the, on the door. I mean, that's just really, really micro, what kind of screws are we using and door hinges and, and that stuff got killed by the 2008 financial crisis. It just, I mean, you, you know, you're sitting there working on your little like hand carved statue and there's a tsunami comes along <laughs> and you're like, good luck. You get a tsunami and just you're, everything gets wiped out. So, so, so this is like, people are not thinking about it in the right way. If they, if they're thinking about it, they're only, they're staring at the, like the little sculpture they got in their hand and, and not keeping an eye on the big picture. So what's your outlook for 2023? As we go into 2023, what do you anticipate to be some of the changes in specific asset classes? You mentioned office, you know, commercial office just getting wiped out. What asset classes do you like? What's Fundrise focused on? Are there any changes in the strategy going forward or are you going to continue to focus on what you've been focused on? I mean, these opportunities and problems come around once every half generation or generation. It's such a big change. I mean, we're the real estate industry and the entire financial system is going to go through a lot of distress next year. I have a podcast, I call it the great deleveraging. And it's about how we went from a low interest rate environment to a high interest rate environment. And that is a big difference. Like for 15 years, interest rates were basically zero from 2008, 2022, they were, they were zero. And from 1981, to 2022, interest rates fell consistently over a long, long period. So we went from 21% interest rates in 1981 to zero. That is a mega trend. That's what I'm talking about, the big mega trends. And now we're going into a rising interest rate environment. It's already happened. And we're not going back to the way it was. Like you can't, you can't un unwind time. You don't foresee rates coming back down? They will come down from, I mean, I think they will come down from where they are. At, they're going to be f likely 5% next year. They might go to 6% and they likely come down to 3% or 3.5%. But we're not going back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. If you look at the major forces in the world, for some time, we're going to be dealing with rising 
rising inflation, rising costs to fund, of fund our debts. And, you know, there's just a lot of drivers that there's, there's labor shortage. So there's going to be more wage push. So you have to assume that the inflation and high rates are the new normal. And a lot of mistakes are made by investors when they don't embrace the new normal. Like they don't stare reality in the face. So they, they, they say, oh, what are they? They're letting what they want to be true get in the way of what is true. And that's, you know, my 2001 experience. So I think inflation and interest, high interest rates are unfortunately new normal, right? You, 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 that you, <laughs> at this point, you have to basically assume that's base case. Maybe they go away, which I think is possible, but maybe they don't. Okay, so that's macro. On a micro, office is going to get destroyed because of work from home. The average physical occupancy in an office building is 50%. And so, you know, as leases roll over and, occup and leased occupancy comes down, you know, you're going to just see tens of billions of dollars, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars of loan defaults. So, and that's going to drag down the whole real estate industry because every lender has office exposure. And then when you go from a low interest rate environment to a high interest rate environment and you have 75% debt, you're likely to have to pay down that debt because you just can't support a six or 7% interest rate at a 75% debt level. And that's a deleveraging or a loan pay down. And that amount of loan pay down is going to be across the whole industry in the billions and billions and billions. And that's going to cause a liquidity crunch. It's already here. This is like, this is, this is a fact of life today that there's liquidity is just gone from the market. If you have a loan and it comes due and you think you're going to extend it, you have not talked to your bank yet. Good luck. Good luck. So we're a liquidity crunch, liquidity crisis, maybe, but definitely a crunch that has all sorts of cascading consequences. But a problem is an opportunity. So we did all this work so we could be resilient and stable in a downturn, which I think we will be. And now we're going to go on the offense. We're going to start, we're starting a credit fund. We have a, and we're going to basically hopefully be a lender into this environment, provide a lot of gap or rescue funding, and hopefully make phenomenal returns from stepping into this, stepping into the breach. So are you raising, are you stockpiling cash right now to get ready for that? One of the learnings from 2008 for me is that you have to prepare for the crisis before the crisis. It's like that story about the ant and the grasshopper and the ants like are saving for the winter and the grasshopper is like singing and, and, and just having a good time. Because when winter hits, it's too late. Right? You can't go gather food when winter hits. There's no liquidity. They can't go gather liquidity today. So we, we've been... I, you know, I've been somewhat paranoid for a while. We we have across the platform five hundred ninety eight million dollars of liquidity, so a lot of liquidity, yeah. and so now it's time to put that money to work. And so we, yeah, so it's it's we'll raise more money, I I believe. But I mean, my plan is to take some advantage of this environment, and I think we will we'll definitely be in a better investment environment than we've been in in a long time. Are you seeing opportunities already to provide gap funding like that that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For I sure. mean, we are we have four multifamily deals that we are under contract to fund gap funding, mezzanine funding. The interest rates are 14%, 15%, 13% for really good real estate, really good debt. I mean, that's great great yield. I mean, to get paid 12% current. Wow. That's, yeah. you know, that's phenomenal. So you mentioned a venture technology fund. Talk to us about the, the venture technology fund as well. You guys do obviously a ton of, you're exposed to a lot of different technology. I think the platforms you're using, you've got firsthand experience of, you know, companies that you may want to get involved in. I'm 
interested in hearing more about why you chose to do a technology fund being, you know, obviously focused in real estate. Why not just focus on real estate? Fundrise is a technology company. People don't yet fully appreciate that. They will over time. It's not something we talk a lot about because it doesn't mean anything until you actually can experience the difference. So we use a lot of technology and we have, of the 300 people at the company, 200 of them are doing technology and 100 of them are doing real estate. And I've been doing this now for 10 years, 12, 11 years, 12, whatever, doing, doing this company for a while. And I worked at a tech company 99 to 01. So I have some experience in technology, 15 years technology and 20 some years real estate. And so I have like strong opinions about, about it. And I've also raised a lot of technology money as, as a company, a tech company. I've, I've worked for, for multiple tech companies that raised money. I've learned about what's good and bad about venture capital. It's not a, a flawless industry. As we everybody's seeing now in the news. So there's, you know, a problem is an opportunity. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So I've been watching venture capital and I'm saying, well, there's like uh, some inefficiencies here. There's things that could be different and better. And we can be different and better because we're different. We're different. I mean, we're not like a private equity fund. We're not like a venture fund. And so that differences can translate to being something that's better in the market. So we started a, a, a fund to democratize investing into pre-IPO tech companies. And we started it at a great time because we started it basically just this year and we've only just started investing it. So we're investing into the tech industry at the, at the what I think is the bottom or near the bottom of the market. So great timing, a very different proposition and we just know so much about technology. It's one of those things you think a venture capitalist knows a lot about technology, and some do. But just like real estate, it's been professionalized. You're much more likely to be a venture capitalist or a private equity and fund investor. If you went to business school, you worked at an investment bank, you worked for a management consultant, right? Not that you were a software programmer. Not that you were doing construction and development, right? It's it's much more about finance than it is about substance, and that's has good good and bad about it. But basically, like we know more about technology than most venture capital companies, and that is not what people think. You know, if you were you know if you didn't know that much about us or about venture, so we have advantages, real advantages, and it's just I mean, the application of technology to business problems is the way you create value in society today. Like that's the, that's the opportunity. That's the work. That's where the most fun is. That's where there's so much happening. And we just get to do that all day. I mean, it's incredible. I can't believe I used to have to do like pure real estate. Now I get to do things that are so much more like dynamic. It's, it's so much more fun. So how are you going about building that fund out? Yeah, like any good technology, you have a product or technology strategy, but you have to start by doing a lot of it by hand. So like we're doing a lot of the first deals and and deal flow by hand. You know, I know, you know, we're in the market. There's just, you know, we for example, we we have a data infrastructure strategy. Data infrastructure is the next big thing. It's already the thing, but it's going to be a bigger thing. And we use all the software we want to invest in, right? And so we're going to, so it's easy to reach out to them and say, hey, by the way, I know we're using your software, but we want to invest in your company. And the person's like, oh, and I get introductions. I mean, I got introductions to people that I, if I came in, I have a, we hired a guy, we hired some people from the venture industry. I have, I have this guy used to work at a private equity fund, you know, tech private equity fund. And he said, it's so funny because I've emailed all these people and they've ignored my emails. And you come in, <laughs> you come in through this other channel and you always get the meeting. And so it's, and again, this is why we're being different is, is an advantage, right? So one of the big differences we're trying to do, and we'll see if we can pull us off, but we, we want to index data infrastructure. 
right? Which is very different. The real estate person or the venture person is opportunistic. They're, they're reactive. They, they, they do a lot of meetings and they, the way they're designed their process is by having a big funnel, seeing a lot of flow, looking for patterns and being opportunistic. So they'll end up with a portfolio that's a little bit random. We, we know what are the 20 technologies in data infrastructure, 20 companies in data infrastructure we want to own. And we're going to figure out, I mean, our goal, I mean, by damn, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to invest in those companies. That's the goal. We're going to index that strategy. And that is so different. And we'll see if we can pull it off. But we, one of the operating principles we have at the company, we have these operating principles it's to help people basically make better decisions. And they're really, really simple. But I think all great insights are simple. So one of them is know what you want. Just know what you want. Like you're graduating from college. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. And then, so if you know what you want, so we know what we want, we know what companies we want, and it's just a question of getting them. And these days, most of them want and need money. And so we, we have what they want and they have what we want. And so I think we'll be successful. But again, it's so different. That's so different than a typical venture fund. Yeah, it's super interesting. It sounds like you're really excited about that. Um, I do want to go back to a little bit more about real estate and touch on the asset classes looking into 2023 that you're focused on. We talked earlier before the podcast started a little bit about build for rent and how that's changing home building. Talk to us a little bit about the asset classes you're looking at, what you're excited about, maybe things the public markets are potentially overlooking. Build for rent is a new space. We define it as we build communities of homes for rent. So imagine an apartment building but instead of it being stacked up, it's it's horizontal. It's detached multifamily, we call it. And so it has a leasing office and it has a um, fitness center and a pool. And so it operates like a multifamily property, but it lives like a single family home. And, and I say like your financial success is a derivative of the consumer experience. And so I say people want single family living but they want the cost and the amenities of multifamily um, properties. So it's a whole new asset class that didn't exist three years ago. And in real estate, when you birth a new asset class, it's usually where the most amount of money is made. So you go back, you know, I mean, hell, you go way back. My, my father was a mall developer. There were no malls. They built tons of malls and now they're, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in malls. And when e-commerce basically got invented, industrial got rebirthed and industrial was a huge success. Um, data centers didn't exist. And then data centers became a huge success. Cell tower REITs, there were no cell towers and they became, you know, last decade, sorry, last decade, the cell tower REITs and the, oh, I mean, this is probably a problem here. The data center REITs and the cell tower REITs were the most successful REITs because they were new and they had a lot of high growth. New things usually grow more. So build for rent is the is the new thing. You can't invest in it in the public markets. It's too early. It's too new. It's, it's basically getting birthed, and we are building it. And we I think will be hopefully the biggest, the most sophisticated. There's so much infrastructure associated with it. It's much more complicated than people realize. And uh, I, mean, I think we we bought and are building 80 communities across the country. So it's like wow. very big business. Forget the cycles, right? It's just like it's a new technology, a new product like the iPhone, and it will be adopted broadly because it's better. It's just a better or it's a new mousetrap. Anybody who has a dog wants to have a backyard. It's fascinating. I love this talk. <laughs> I've been taking notes, like I said, like, you know, I'm going to have many more pages of notes here to study. So, Ben, this has really been great. I really appreciate your time. It's been Awesome to learn about you. Awesome to learn about the company, Fundrise. If for our listeners that want to maybe reach out to you, learn more about you personally or, or Fundrise, what's the best way for them to do that? I'm pretty active on Twitter. I mean, Twitter's just a good way to connect with people. So I'm Ben Millerize, like, like Fundrise, but Ben Millerize on Twitter. So you could just like, you know, DM me or tweet at me and I'll, and I'm like, I love learning new things, right? And you, the way you learn new things is you connect with new people. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm like pretty open, even though like Twitter these days has gotten like a little strange. <laughs> it's a great place to learn though, if you, um, properly you yeah. know, do it. You can get you can get more news information on Twitter than you can get from newspapers. No question, it's better. I learned about the pandemic in like probably late January 2020 from Twitter, and then you just didn't hit the radar of uh, of media until March. Yeah, so Twitter, uh, and then obviously we've got Fundrise website. People can check that out and learn more about the company there as well, right? Yeah, Fundrise.com or investments at Fundrise.com. Contact at Fundrise.com. Yeah, I mean we're we're customer centric. So you re reach out to us. Like we're going to be responsive. Awesome. Ben, this has been great. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I just add one point that I think is super important about networking and that is follow up. People do so much networking and then they never follow up. I mean, I've probably met a hundred people once. I can walk around a city and redevelop sites in my head as I'm walking around the city. It's just intuitive to me.